，就是我们这次的呃净土的题目的公布。那我们这次，我跟大家先介绍一下，因为有些很很多新生同学可能不一定了解，每一每一年的学年的开始的 competition 是我们呃交大最重要的一个传统。那我们已经连续五届，那这个传统呢，几乎是两个目的。第一个目的是让全所的所有的同学在刚进回来交大，或者是刚进交大的同学在第一学期的第一天就开始 join 在一起。那这里面包括数位组、设计组跟 M R One 学士后的同学，都能够在还没开开始认识的时候就一同作战。那这个对我们来讲是意义重大，因为我们不管是数位组跟设计组。包括 M R One 来自于都是不同的背景，所以这个不同的背景，我们希望把建筑的这个 category 稍微放大，在文化、艺术还有各种不同的领域层面，大家都可以贡献。那大家不要忘记，大家在包括 M R One 同学本来在学建筑之前是来自于四面八方，那这个是在我们的这个所跟其他所很很重要的一个一个不同。那这一点是我们想要做的第一个目的。第二个目的是我们。希望我们这个所永远有一次，全部在刚开学的时候有一个非常正式的 review， 我们自己的整个教育系统，还有跟我们外界现在世界上发展的各种不同事情的 linkage。那这是一个非常重要的一个一个一个净土的传统。那在这样的一个本意跟传统，这五年下来，我们每一年都会邀请一位所谓的出题的主持人，那也是我们的策展人啊。那这个出题主持人跟策展人其实会由他全权来 organize 整个的题目。那我们都尊重我们这次呃所出题的的老师。那我们当初在选老师的时候，一路下来也有一个传统，我们希望我们呃五届下来的老师基本上都是国际的华人。第一个是要跟我们自己本身的的台湾或者是亚洲或者是华人之间的系统里面能够有一个联系。能够对我们自己所处的环境，或者是我面对的问题有一个比较大的连接以外，为什么要到此到目前为止都是要一个国际的华人？是因为我觉得台湾其实在某种程度上最需要改变是那个封闭性，所以我们希望借由国际华人在国际所看到的事情来跟我们做交流。那我们当然之后的 studio 有很多老师都是在台湾呃职业非常非常有经验而且很好的老师。那在这样的架构之下。我们其实从第一届开始到现在，曾经邀请过王维仁老师，然后邀请过德国，现在在读德国职业，也在在台湾东海毕业的林友涵老师，然后我们还邀请了在美国背景的 h i m m e r s l i d e 就是在前年参加威尼斯代表台湾参加威尼斯双年展台湾馆的 h i m m e r s l i d e 那唯一只有一一届稍微跳开我们这个系统，是在去年。那去年跳开系统是因为刚刚好，所有一斗，这个一东风熊邀请我们去参加熊本的 Home for All， 所以那一次的机会非常难得，所以那一次的机会直接就把我们的净土由一东风熊出的这个 Home for Home for All， 让我们的学生跟日本的熊本的这整个比赛跟净土在一起。那这当然也是因为他邀请我们，很荣幸被他邀请是呃四个到五个国家里面的其中一。那我们上次同学进图完去了也，也也得到非常好的一个一个一个 credit。那我想这也是很棒的。那唯一的，它跟其他界的进图不一样的是，它稍微离开了我们当初想找的国际华人的建筑师来来出题的这个范围。那今年我们又把它拉回来，还是希望回到这条主轴上。那是不是这条主轴一直维持？我们是尽量能够在这个里面找到呃很重要的人。第二个。我们从王维仁开始，一直到林友涵，一直到 Humor Slide， 一直到现在，我们希望找到的呃出题者，国际华人的这这个 category 里面，希望会有比较有经验的老中青三代，应该没有老了。王维仁我不敢说他老，因为他跟我们待遇差不多，所以也算是中生代。<笑>那再过来，林友涵大概比我小个两三岁，那之后的 Humor Slide 算很年轻，三十几岁。那我们希望维持这个这个转动状态，让所有各种不同世代在看建筑的这个概念。所以有的建筑的题目会出的很实际，有的建筑的题目会出的非常艺术
，有的时候是思考力很强。那当然是在这样子的一个架构里面，呃，来营营造我们整个净土的概念。那净土也是一个比赛，那这个比赛呢，我们基本上会有一个，我们不希望是通通有奖，应该是叫做赢者全拿。所以我们每一次只会有一个最后的的胜选奖，啊，最后的优等奖，其他的其实就是参与啊。那我们。我们不希望说只是大家人人有奖，可是每一年会有一些一些不一样的，比如说去年是到日本去，今年可能会有别的形式，那会在我们内部的奖项之外，会有另外一些不同的策展跟 category。那这个大概是我们这几届下来的一个一个一个概念。以前的传统，我们同学们这个净土都非常非常投入 ，OK， 虽然只有十天到十一天。那大概是几乎是全天候的在做这样子的净土，也也因为这样子，所以我们几乎尽量的都能够把这两个礼拜的所有的重心 focus 都在这一点，让我们的同学们的其他的课能够尽量的排开。不过理论课、其他的课如果要一定不能停的话，我们还是会让它照走。所以请大家同学一定要配合，如果照常上课的，千千万不要为了净土而离开这个、这个、这个。该上课的这条路上，第二个很重要的是，今天发完题目之后，下礼拜五，学会本身要整合所有的同学，我们会先做一个布展，我们会由今天的邀请的主持，呃，建筑师出题以外，邀请评审来这边做一整天的讨论。所以下礼拜五，我们定在礼拜五，礼拜五那天是全所一定要参加，从讨论开始就一直要参加。那这而且在我们讨论之前，布展要布展完毕。我们的布展会在这次会在礼拜四就停止布展啊，礼拜四晚上就要布展完毕。礼拜五一大早我们就要开始。那原因是因为我们把我们的今年的迎新放在下礼拜五的晚上，也就是中秋夜的前前两天。那所以我们会是一整天的活动，请大家同学注意，一定要全程参加，包括晚上的我们的迎新啊。那这是我跟大家先，呃，大概先事先说。那紧接着我跟大家介绍我们今天的，呃，好不容易邀请到的，呃，特别的来宾建筑师汤姆斯曾曾庆豪曾老师。我今天在暑假两个多月前就已经跟曾老师先 booking， 那非常不容易，因为我们的时间固定，我们的开学时间固定，我们评估时间固定。所以本来曾老师今天是有事的，还有礼拜五也有事，他就把它排开来，为了配合我们的这一个。那我先介绍一下曾老师。曾老师其实是我刚刚讲 generation 里面最年轻，而且是非常年轻，而且是非常成熟的，刚好这个年纪。他四十岁嘛？对，四十一。四十一 ，OK。那大概就是建筑师，四十岁是一个起步，开始看到自己在做什么事的的的年纪。那这个对领大家很重要，我常说。我们如果有个 r o m a d o 要去学习或者去看这个世界发生什么事，大概比你大概十到十五岁，千万不要看我们，因为你看我们，我们过的时代跟你完全不一样。所以我们非常希望邀请的是三十五到四十岁的建筑师，而且有非常有经验。那更不用说呃曾老师，他们是曾老师，他 r e s u m e 就这样一点啊，吓死人的一点，我没办法一一介绍，我很很简单的介绍。等一下他会有一个 talk， 他也会顺便介绍一下他自己现在在关心的事。跟他做过的事，那曾老师基本上是一个建筑师，也是一个理论家，其实本上本身也是一个非常完整而且成熟的策展人，所以他在这整个履历里面，大部分的时间除了教书，在学术上做教育以外，其实自己写了非常非常多的 paper， 那这个 paper 在全世界，还不只是在香港或华人世界，在全世界非常多地方发表，然后呢，跟国际非常多人一起做策展，那如果大家有兴趣，我们。会把这个也发给大家，让大家看到他的整个 resume 的历程。那他的大学是在 Cooper Union， 是在美国最好最好，我认为美国 under 就是大学部最好的一个大学，最具实验性，也具最具理论性的一个实验性的学校。库珀联盟 Cooper Union 在纽约，他这边念完大学以后又到罗马去，去念他的下一个学位。那在中间其实他已经曾经在 Cooper Union 教过书，后来现在在。香港大学也也是专任的助理教授，所以他整个对于建筑的理解其实是非常全面的。那我们常说，身为一个 professional 建筑师，必须自己自己要有 practice， 
，还必须要论述性，必须你对于时代性的观察还有艺术的连接也非常非常的重要。所以我们这次挑了好久，我们几位老师一致的决定要请曾老师这次来出帮我们出题目。那这这次曾老师出的题目其实也非常有趣，其实有点 philosophical， 跟哲学有点关系，可是又大家听到会很害怕，因为。两年前的 h u m o r o u s 那个是更更抽象的，可是因为曾老师他其实这几年下来有非常完整的经验，他完全知道怎么把所有的美学、艺术跟建筑结合在一起。那包括曾老师最近跟台湾最接近的一次的策展，就是今年二零一五年刚结束的《未知的云朵》，是跟阮清月老师一起策的展，邀请了非常多华人到北美馆去做一个建筑展，可是也是一个艺术展。也是一个装置展，那这个是我最近几年看到，呃，整理的非常好，而且广阔面拉到亚洲的很多很多的面面向的一个建筑展。那那里那个时候再过来还有一个很重的一个叫路易康，完全的不同的的的 c a r a v a y 可是我们都称为它是建筑的概念。那我想再多的事情我大概没办法把这个全部都都说完。那我们再一次的欢迎汤姆斯曾老曾老师。Okay, um, I'm gonna. S is it okay if I speak in English? Really? Yeah. It's especially good when you have the back person sitting. The father says, "Yes, no problem," and the people in the front, "Holy shit!" No, I'm not bad. <laughs> so, um, I think this is a very fascinating. Um, I've been giving lecture in Taiwan quite a bit, and um, last time I had a lecture, I gave a. It's called. Unlearning, forget everything that you've done, and come to architecture school, have doubts, criticalities, and basically unlearn the things that you thought you're supposed to learn. Because most of you probably went to architecture school thinking that you're gonna thinking about architecture's building. Then later you got into architecture. Later you start to realize, ah, it's a little philosophical, technological, and you realize that the architecture becomes very small. Little, you find a niche in yourself very small. Suddenly, everything starts to get become miniaturized. You find a niche within the larger field. How many of you are first year in architecture? <laughs> Usually, the first group, right? <laughs> it's the, it's the, the cool group is always the last one, right? Um, so how many of you studied design before uh, in, the, in, the, in the first? Not many, right? Literature, philosophy. Biology, medicines, science, you know, etc. Philosophy, literature, essay. Okay. <laughs> um, as a, as a, as a brief introduction, um, I came to architecture. I thought I knew what architecture was. When I went to first year in architecture school, I was completely drunk with knowledge. I was intoxicated because at some point after I graduate, I cannot even say. What is an architecture? So I completely lost in it. Architecture school is like that. It's intoxicating. You will get very addicted. You might even start to do PhD, or you might even teach and come back to it. Or some people get intoxicated and so intoxicated they cannot come back to school again. So architecture is really either hate it or you love it. You have to do it for a personal reason. So. My personal issue with you, I will work with you guys for two weeks only. This in, this introduction and the last time I will meet you. So basically, we have fourteen days, right? Fourteen days, and we are looking at fourteen groups together. It's a matter of survival. This is one of those competition that you're given. You don't know what the prize is because you never know exactly how you get that. How do you win a project? A lot of good competition project won by a lot of architects is not because they follow the rule. They question the program. Usually, people who wrote these programs are generally borrowed programs from other places, so they basically don't really know exactly what to say. Your architects basically are the voices. Right? You have to create the voices. You have to frame the ideas. You have to frame your society. You have to frame exactly where this thing we're going ahead. A lot of things quietly unknowing.
this is the Anomi, right? <laughs> it's vivid colors and vivid life. And that's not the uh, competition part. Yet. I have two slide presentation. Uh, the first part, I will, I will try to go briefly, but even though it's 100 slides, I edited it already, I promise. At some point, uh, we're going to be all work, work, work. I wonder if you could shut this front light in okay. here. I, well, I have triple work because I have triple identity. Um, I teach. Um, I pretend to write. Um, and I pretend to work. Right? Um, there's a term in the Italian term called uh, spazzatura. Is to make your work look effortless, right? As though you put a lot of work, but it looked like it's effortless, because that's an art you have to get through. You know, here in our university, we always have to exert. We have to stay all night. But you could have many characters. Um, my personality is I always want to do architecture in many ways. So I do architecture through publication books, teaching, exhibitions, and I build things. Also, just mainly to talk about it. So usually I build buildings so we have something to talk about. And I'll explain a couple of things in here. Yesterday on my flight, I came on my flight and I read this article. Smaller cities are the best bet for future growth. And it's like, that's an interesting article. My context is because I work a lot in a, um, in a large city, but Hong Kong is not a very big city. It's very dense. It's not a very big city. But I work a lot in China. There are big cities, but not very dense. Mainly because there's a lot of buildings built, but there's also a lot of buildings not occupied. So what that means is that as cities get bigger, um, in Pearl River Delta, where, I'm, my, where my location is in Hong Kong, they said that it would be, one day it would be one of the largest cities in the world. At some point, it won't be a city, it will be a state, a province, or maybe a country, right, at that scale. So we start to, start to looking back, is perhaps maybe something needs to go back a bit, return to maybe some of the fundamental things. I ask this question to you all, mainly because also to ask your first fundamental question that you come in into architecture school, or the one also leaving architecture school, what are we looking at? What are we collecting? What are every city has to represent? One of the phenomena in cities, in all the cities in the world, everybody would want to have a Zahadi, Hudzat de Derman, OMA, class. If you don't have it, you're not a city. You're not a cool city, right? So let's, let's think about this, and I will, I will prove it. I'm going to brainwash you. I usually run this lecture, it's almost like a brainwash or brainstorm. So this is a project of my work. Um, usually I try to minimize all my work to one single image, but it will take 100 drawings just to get to that. Right? How do you select the point? How do you edit? And that's a lot of crucial of my work. It's about editing. Through ed teaching, I don't teach students how to design. You cannot teach design. You can help edit. And when you curate, it's all about editing and deciding, not telling the artist or the architect what to do, <laughs> You're telling what exactly you could get direct to. And one of the most important things, even my experience as students or as a teacher, is that editing is the most hardest thing to do. It's easy to produce, but hard to edit. I know, I know this uh, one that was mentioned about um, you, a lot of you guys are under uh, graduate school, but this might be your first time studying architecture. I, and I thought I'd share this pers personally with you. This is the first architecture book I read. It's called the um, Alto Rossi Scientific Autobiography. Um, Alto Rossi is a teacher of many other um, you know, phenomenal architects. He's an educator. He started as a journalist. And he wrote this book called the Scientific Autobiography. It's basically a book of many books, little books. Is a note. Is his notes that he jot out everything he sees, and he collect it into a book. So when you read it, it's very hard to understand. That was my first year architecture. When I was about 17, 16, I read this book, and I didn't understand what the hell it was because I could see all the notes I made. 
then I didn't know exactly, but I'm still reading it. So today I'm gonna use this book to organize all my pro most selected project based on the reading of that book. Make sure we have batteries. <laughs> so I'm sure you guys are gonna have your first architecture book. Just treat architecture like you want to fall in love, right? If you want to figure out what was the memorable thing, but you always go back to it. This was a very important book. Anyhow, I will explain to you a little bit. I'm gonna go in and out a couple of things. Do you guys have to write student evaluation to your teacher at the end of the semester before the teacher gave you grades? So this is something I, uh, I took from my student. They have to write something about me. Right? So I will present to you, very honest. Of course, it was a very high grade, but Thomas is a very creative person. He can always inspire me. It could be her, him, I don't know. Right? <laughs> but then in the second part, right, you realize Thomas sometimes doesn't talk clearly <laughs> in the sense of logic. And everything seems like a brainstorm. <laughs> I think there might, but could be more <laughs> rational <laughs> so that we can understand. Okay. So when I was reading, I was trying to analyze what, what, when you get inspired, when you fall in love with something, you don't really know. It's not logical things, you know? You're, you're attracted by the, the smell. The, the visuals, the shoes, or the socks, or the hair. There's a lot of things you don't really know, but you just impulses, right? So you try the logic, you maybe meet the person second time, maybe you understand. Then the third time you realize, I don't want to see this person ever again, because the logic falls into place, right? That's why when you read the book of Rossi, it's, it's completely logical, right? And because you have to understand that you have to read the text like you're drinking a a wine or something, you have to just take it in, just move it. Something is precious. But if you're trying to take the text like a buffet, you just chomp it the whole you're trying to finish the whole book one day, you're basically trying to put forty years of experience into one night. It's impossible. You cannot do that. So I've been reading the same book for almost twenty years. <laughs> over and over, just to get a state of what am I at? What is my what is my position in architecture? So when I wrote this, I thought this is this is funny. Everybody enjoy it because there's a vulnerability I like to reveal, but there's also maybe it could be a strength in that in my relation to you. I, I don't want to show you this because um, that was a lecture I gave. Um, so I so in this case I thought I could show you my project blah 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 chronologically. Chronological might not even give a sense, but I want to divide it into three chapters and looking that through Alter Rossi's words, right? So the first one's autobiographical. And the second one's called miniatures, and the third one's forgetting. Forgetting has to do with memories, and I'll later I will explain, and I still, maybe the things that might be quite influential, I feel this is quite, things reoccurring in a lot of architecture themes and arts, in every general in culture and everything. Okay. The thing about Rossi is that I was very interested in his early work when he was a transition between a writer to an architect. When he was probably similar like your age, when you were a graduate student, he was writing for a magazine called Casabella. He was 26 years old. He was an editor for an architecture magazine. That was his kind of side interest. But he was writing in terms of politics, in terms of where architecture would be heading. He basically, he was trying to shape architecture through words. Later, we were trying to do it through form. So there was a lot of things that relates to about um, Rossi in that case, is that seeing parts, small things, related to large. That's why I call it from parts to units. Then another thing I want to refer is from unit to parts. Think about this relationships, and I would, I would probably help to render it again as 
And I don't believe Sartre City is getting larger, you know, six or eight million people, but I think it needs to start to divide. The strength of the future city is to get smaller, not larger. So Rossi, in his text, he mentioned fragments. For him, it's very, very important because if one little part express the whole thing. And then he describes that, you know, you could, how do you, where do you collect these fragments from? And these fragments could be objects, artifacts, things that relate to a larger part of the city. So in other words, um, you know, if you take a broken bus, technically you don't want to actually put it all together or renovate. Well, what, let me give you an example. A good way is that, you know, sometimes you, you do um, tourist travel and you, they, they, there's a tendency to build a like a 19th or 18th century or 17th century villa, colonial house, to look like so that you show you have wealth and culture by building 18th century. But they build it too complete in a way. Could they actually just build a little fragment so you as a visitor can complete the whole entire image then rather than saying that's the complete image. That's what Rossi kind of refer as that fragment. I'll show you a couple projects because I always think that reading and writing, which I call it designing, comes hand to hand together. This is a project that I did uh, for the Shenzhen Biennial. Basically, um, in the city area called Dongguan, which is the factory of the world, you probably know, right? You probably know all your anything that could be manufactured is all within this place. But this place used to have a lot of mountains. But if you look at Google Maps, you don't see the mountain anymore. Not because they built over the mountain, they took the mountain out. Because it was, it was for convenience to build a factory flat than on a ramp. So sometimes I would take a flight and I see Dongguan, one mountain is chipping off. Like one mountain one side, when I flew around, the mountain is slowly shaving off. But what happens, and what my research was about, was looking at what happened to these islands, are these mountains around it. So there's basically no public spaces in Dongguan, the factory. But also right now, Dongguan is also, there's a couple hundred factory closes within a couple weeks. That also means that it's also depopulated. These factories are empty. They might look full as a physical form, but they're empty, just like this wall behind it. So we made some category of images and collages that we use it to describe, make prospects, which we try to integrate, to show things that are possible and not possible. So Rossi continued while talking about the fragment as a result. There's, there's somewhere between the logic and the biographies, right? I think what we refer is that when you enter an architecture, you do it for personal reason, as opposed to a professional. But that's why you prefer the biographies. You're writing histories in the cases. Every move, every subject you do the work, you're always writing some form of text. Okay? So. This is a fragment I was interested in. I was interested in how to build a project with only four millimeter thickness. This is not the project. This is the project is being built right now. And before this, this is actually one of the Hong Kong's oldest building, which happened to be a prison. So you imagine that any civic building is Hong Kong decide to keep, it's always end up being this very civic building. The English are very, they're very convenient, right? They have a police station, a courthouse, and a jail within one of the same blocks. So if I catch you, and I could, we'll be good. within 48 hours, 24 hours, you'll be put in, into prison immediately. And so that was, the whole block defines the whole, some, in the entire city. So this was actually the former prison in Hong Kong, right in the middle, the most expensive site in, in Hong Kong right now is a void. 
and has been there for about 30, 40 years as empty. So I did this project, I thought, could I something relate between a relationship between a city, an empty space, a prison? So I was trying to use a, a material that could connect all of them together. So you can see that this is a spring attached and a weave through. So basically I weave the whole entire building with this string. And the string is actually 30 32 kilometers long, which is the distance between the prison and to Shenzhen. So as a subject, when I run into work, I always play with terminology and words. I always precise measurements. I always use the measurement always to incite some idea, idea of what meanings and culture run through. So the installation work weaves in, weaves out. So what, what I was here, this is the, the Hollywood sign. What? If you look at it, you probably, this is not the, this is probably the best view you can see, but it's also the view that you see the back of the sign. Um, I also spent one year, I took a year off from uh, architecture school and I spent one year at Juilliard School. It's a, it's a school for music, uh, dance, and also uh, drama. I was interested learning how to, I was interested about stage and narrative, but I didn't want to learn design. So I want to work in the back of the house to see exactly what goes on. So I've been haunted by this image because I never saw all the work I've done in the front, I always saw it in the back. And I said, that's the best part because everything's so dynamic and you see the whole thing cross sections and stuff. So I was very curious about that in the work. How many, how many of you seen the exhibition called Clouds of Unknowing, uh, City with Seventh Street? Right, you might saw, okay, so you might be familiar with this project. Uh, there's a thing called the, the Street of Utopia. I uh, collaborated with a, a writer named Oni. That's the first thing I want to have this image, is to enter into this room. You don't know if you're the front or the back. So we enter, you have all the structures. That also means that when you design the structures, the back of the structure has to be almost as beautiful as the front. Things that people don't see, right? The back of the chair, you know, everything is always done perfect. When you look underneath, it's disastrous. Oh my God. So I want to try to reverse this logic, the logical, is to enter so that even the back is almost as pristine as the front. I think you probably uh, sat through. And this was the idea of depicting one image language. This image was sent through a, uh, a WeChat image, and it was like this big. But I had to make it 60 times larger to fit the whole entire room. But also the thing is that also, as technology gets advanced, resolutions gets incredibly advanced, but what do we want if we want more higher resolutions? The idea was, I thought, is it possible to use something as small as low resolution to enlarge it? But that's the transition of the author among architects or designer. How do you make that transition? For us, if we had the high resolution, it might not even actually make it more closer to that reality. Throughout the whole process, we work with an engineer, and so the discussion of the project was how do you make the important details that has to be visible? So then that question, the structure also has an aesthetic to it. It's not just a logical thing. It's a very illogical way of building, but it was actually, you know, somehow, it's also revealed its characteristic of the design as well. So at the end, we have to cut the grass, not because it was growing, but So, chapter two, talking about the miniatures. Rossi also refers to things that, at some point, our experience thing has to come from 
tiny little things. Right? It's because it gives you a reference from something that could be before or after. I don't know, that's a little bit abstract, little abstract to describe. But can you find something, like for example, an image, a car, like a building that was being demolished or under construction? Can you say that it's, before, it's construction or demolishing? And I want you guys to think about this. Maybe some of the image that you have in your own personal experience. And Oning is the one I collaborate with. He wrote in his, um, he was a curator for the Shenzhen Biennial. He wrote that miniaturization is pretty much a entertainment and tourism culture exists in the Chinese landscapes. <laughs> like when you collect bonsai trees, the rocks, it's that thing's supposed to express a larger universe. Like library in a way. Or everything is starting to get compact, your hard drive starts to get compact. This is another form of miniaturization. But the question is also coming with all this incredible amount of information, how do you access to it? So what he says is also which is also you know, you know, in China, there's a lot of, um, they make fake Austria town, so the people who travel there, and they get so excited, they all want to see the real thing, right? Um, the Eiffel Towers, there's plenty of around the world. Apparently, there's about 300 copy Eiffel Tower around the world. And everybody usually go to the original, they always get disappointed. They realize, oh, it's smaller than I thought. <laughs> And I think that's very interesting. At the point, what point do you decide what scale is appropriate? So anyhow, we have many fragments in this case. We see this every day. Uh, what's excited about our civilization is a fragment that either tell us when, when does time really stops in this case. Huh? I want to refer one thing here. What happens if you talk about miniaturizations? Also, you realize that the short history, I mean, histories are pretty short. Very short, how to remember. If we still refer to World War II, we are taking a very short history of a larger history, right? So that's why um, I want to refer us about things that we're defining right now. Um, if I ask you guys to collect something within the next issue, it's rather a short history of a large one but you're part of it, you're, it's actually building into these series of chapters. I want to see. Um, you know Wang, Sh Wang Shu, right? This architect, you might know. Um, you might know him because he won the Pritzker Prize, but if you, he didn't win it, nobody knows him. Yeah. That's generally the case. At what point do we, do we, what point do we determine who is the voices of this generation in period? And I thought there was something very curious about his, his Pritzker Prize speech. And it, basically they were asking him, and he said, you know, in Chinese interior architecture, it's only three generations behind. So when he said that he was studying in Nanjing, and the question that was asked him is, um, you know, what is architecture? Um, Tongjin is also Tongming's father. I mean, that's not something you might want to refer to. But he was an architect, but at some point he became also a well known uh, garden scholar. And he said that um, the question is like, how do you different the architecture in cases of that tradition? What is architecture? And his teacher humbly replied, architecture is just a small thing. It could be a two metaphor. He said that architecture might not be important. Less than, or maybe literally just a small thing. Like I said, like Rossi, it's something you have to read. In which point of period do you read as something small, physically small, or something leaves insignificant? So, <clears throat> this thing that I thought um, when I came to, uh, from Hong Kong, I was teaching in Cooper Union before. When I taught in Hong Kong, I also taught in, China, in, in Hangzhou, um, in the China Academy. And I also create a, a problem for the class. And basically, it was not about, I didn't ask questions to design anything. 
uh, I was interested in getting Stephen to see the form, but not the shape. If you, if you think about it, what's the difference between form and shapes? So form could be things that come invisible. Shapes could be things that um, could be something that in front of your eyes, right? So I was interested in exactly what is the form of the city. So I asked 20 questions that work with us and asked them to collect objects that defines the city. So one, of the, one uh, example of movie I said, uh, have you guys watched the movie called Lost in Translation? Do you know this movie? Yeah. yeah. But have you noticed when he says uh, in Chinese, is realized it's lost in Tokyo. It's not lost in translation. So there's a difference between language. Because I asked the student for 30 minutes, like, just like you guys, nobody raised any questions, right? Because they thought, what is this movie? But they know the movie because it was translated called Lost in Tokyo. You could only possibly be lost in the physical place you cannot possibly be lost in translations. So this is how the project came about. So this student was interested in the idea of collecting <coughs> a tomatoes. Is tomato a fruit or vegetable? That was the student asked. And then the whole project came about, right? It's talking about, it's referring about the genealogies, right? And so then eventually you start collecting that tastes like tomatoes or has an attribute of tomatoes and vitamins. Right? So she started to build up all these collections. So the, in the end, the shape was not important, but the form still maintained. Right? You could select it by the color, you could select it by the attributes of the vitamins you can create, you could collect you know, how much water is in it, whatever it is. It's things that the person starts to think about. So, so in, in the end, we all have this certain desire. It's like, it is impossible to create without desire, and certainly no remains imagine itself to be to, to, to a commodity. Um, architecture is, is um, I would say maybe 10 years ago, architecture is one of the greatest capital. But now, I'm not sure about that. And sorry to say that you guys go into architecture, you're, gonna, you're thinking that developing architecture is capital, but you realize it might not be the capital anymore. Maybe the capital is by the shape, but maybe the capital still exists in the form. Right? Remember, Rossi wrote this on his little sketchbook, right? Napkin, he collected these notes. It was not, he sat down and wrote the whole thing. He wrote it in fragments. One of the things I always play with people's desire, I always, not, not people's desire, but my own desire. I like to create, I like to design furniture, but a lot of the time the furniture is a bit out of scale. Um, I designed this table. It's 20 meters wide. Why did I say it's a table? It is a table. Right. You could put a chair, sit. But I also decided to use a material that I could always make a table. I, does not, I decided not to use wood to cover the top. I use paper. If I use wood, that would mean it would become a platform. People could stand on it. But if it's a paper, people cannot step on top of it. So this is why I define the characteristic of each thing. This is a scale. Right? So those important things I refer about, something about being front and back, I could go around so I don't know which one is front or back. The only way determined by that is by the room where you enter. So basically I push the program to the edges. And I still use the structure of the methods like I've been before about the wood stacking it so that the wood also becomes this form. That was the largest table I made. I have another table which is a bit smaller than that, but I didn't show you. But it's half the size. 
But in the end, I was talking about this commodity. This is the work of um, Rossi. It was a, called the resistance, uh, the monument to resist the Quaino. But he always make the same shh form every time for competition. For about three years, he always used the same cue, relentless. But it was never built. But he keep focusing on this thing because it was some desire that he could have seen. You know this, right? This is in Beijing. This is somebody's uh, rock garden. They built a whole entire rock garden on the roof. It got so huge that people didn't realize that this person went out of control. At some point, they asked them, can you demolish it? He said it was good for feng shui. Huh? <laughs> This is a uh, Bruni. <coughs> oh, yeah, I, want, I want to close this out because I, I still have another presentation for you. But um, the things about uh, we know that uh, a couple years ago, China was building cities, but there's also building a lot of museums, right? Every there was calculation was 300 museums. Uh, per year, new museum. But a lot of the museum later becomes restaurants because they cannot. Is it possible to maintain all this culture at once? So uh, there was a museum uh, asked me to design a sign and asked me if I could design a sign. Uh, my first question is that, you know, if I give you a different shapes, I would, I won't know exactly what to determine which is a good design or not, right? But I said, I asked him, how wide is the, is, the, is the sign? He said, two meters. So I asked him, I'll come back. So I gave him a proposal. So I, I proposed that to build a smaller museum. So the museum is actually inside a wall. <coughs> and you have to enter, you could enter your museum through this vocal. <coughs> Um, I also do a lot of collaboration with a composer. Uh, it's a professor from UC Berkeley. <clears throat> so I asked them to compose a sound for the building. Because in the process when I built this project, it was a lot of about dealing with acoustic. Not finding a perfect acoustics, but finding a point where the building becomes an instrument. When you guys do a lot of projects, you're always talking about architecture become instruments, but literally this is an instrument it's that the composer wrote a piece for it. This is a single pour concrete. So in other words, it's not prefab, but it's something that was built within it. The idea of miniature museum, the term miniature museum, <coughs> sorry, also came out with a mobile museum. This is the work of Duchamp, right? He basically built the whole entire museum, later work. He built about, I think, 60 of these, but there's only, I mean, Duchamp was interested in about copies, making copies in the different version. So he's interested about building a whole museum that would then contain within one box. It's his last, kind of say his last work. This project, my major in Berlin, also, I'm also collaborating with another world's smallest museum, which happened to be in Switzerland. And this museum is called the Kunsthalle Marshall Duchamp. It's related to Marshall Duchamp's work. Last year, I went to visit, I went to Switzerland to visit this museum. And I said, yeah, you know what? Your museum is smaller than mine. <laughs> I'm absolutely uh, disappointed. I said, we should collaborate. I said, yeah. Why not take your museum, put it inside my miniature museum? <laughs> and we talked, and we got, we got a lot of ideas. And um, so this is, we're developing this project. I mean, the museum, this museum is pretty well known for replacing other museums. What museum in Munich? 
This museum was under construction, so they didn't have a museum, so they asked if they could build a miniature museum right in front of it, so people could actually look through the work of the collection. And I also worked with a museum from uh, M Plus in Hong Kong, and, um, and I worked with them, which is a temporary uh, pavilion, which I built it, then I buried it with earth. Mainly because I just felt like this land was built as a reclaim, it's flat. So I just had the intention, how do I bring earth to cover something so that it's no longer flat in that place? But that, that was a, some, you know, the project is always sub absurdities. Right? You built it to hide it, right? as opposed to built it to show it. So nobody could find this project, you know, because <laughs> in different angle you just see a dirt. You don't know if there was a building behind it. And this, this is the project. It's right here. This is Mar Paul, Paul McCartney's dog shit. <laughs> so, because my project kind of looks like the mount, <laughs> and this is a, this is a cockroach, <laughs> and a bee, and a, a child face, a fucking pig. Uh, Korean artists, but they're all inflatable. But they told me I cannot do. In, you're an architect. You cannot do inflatable work. You have to do something with that we could <laughs> occupy. So, so that was the deal. So I had to make something that is kind of utility, as opposed to utopic. Okay. Anyhow, um, I, I want to close. I always feel like I close on every slide. Was I was I, one of the interesting about look at my work? You said there's a temporalness about it. Um, I'm interested in the idea of temporalities. Uh, even it may be more permanent to your mind than the temporality of the physical. So that means that you could forget about it, or you cannot. Barcelona Pavilion. You know this Barcelona Pavilion, right? It was actually built in 1929, but only exhibit for one year, and then it disappeared for about 57 years, and then it got rebuilt in 1986. So I was I was interested in fascinating. The actual the actual uh, Barcelona Pavilion it still exists in material, but not assembled. And what I heard about this, they, when they built the pavilion, you know what it was supposed for? Besides being a pavilion, but it's to show the glass. It's not the marble. It was showing the German glass, how clear it is that you can see it without reflection. So the whole idea was actually, the whole building was to show glass that you don't even see. Well, you see, but you don't really see it, right? So I find that this is a very fascinating in terms of <coughs> thing. So what I teach a class, and basically I examine about architecture history through architecture exhibition. Deconstruction, international style. Why they exist? It's not because somebody came out with the concept. It's because it came through an architectural exhibition. And that's when the terminology and stylistic terminology arrived through. It created through an event, conference, or things that exhibit. And we basically, at my class, we study in my seminar, we study the exhibition culture, exactly where does architecture history read through, as opposed to reading chapter 268, international styles, but where it exists, but it's actually looking at it, looking at the plan, looking at everything, all the elements that exist through it. You probably know this. Okay, I'm going to go through quickly because uh, um, it's, it's, you might be too exhausted. You might even decide not to do this competition again. Basically, I created projects where an exhibition is 24 hours. You could go see the exhibition where all the doors are closed. When the, and then you could also sleep inside. So when the front door is closed, you could open the door and you could sleep inside the gallery. So it ran 24 hours a day. Uh, this is an exhibition I've done, um, a Garden City. Uh, this is a gallery, an architecture gallery in uh, uh, Chungsan District, uh, and they have a small gallery. And so I thought, why not I actually create an exhibition that the first thing you enter, you don't see anything. Once you go at the end, all the exhibition works are on this beam. And these are all of my, uh, well, it's not so great, but you can see it's all of my investigating my built project made it into a plaster model. 
because there was a text, uh, because I thought it was curious, it was an architecture bookstore, and Victor Hugo wrote something called The Dying of the Cornice, and I thought, hmm, I could put all the architecture model as a plaster and a cornice, because they were saying that architecture book was going to kill architecture. The printing press was going to kill architecture. No sorry for the printing press outside, <laughs> because you're not going to go see our, our architecture. You're going, to, you're going to see the book. I would say <clears throat> even the iPhone starts to kill architecture. Um, but it refers to something in here. But I, I was curious. But I was curious that I'm sure nobody saw the exhibition because the first thing they saw was an empty room. They said, "I thought there was an exhibition in the room, but I don't see anything." But and so at one point, how far did they get back to actually see the work? Okay, I, um, I thought I could show this a, a short video to explain this is the, the curating project. Because I want... You guys seen this? As a, as a curator, we actually oh, I also designed this project because there was no designer. We cannot hire a designer. So we just said, we'll just do it for nothing. So what I got through, I went through the archive of Chen Chi Huan's work. Things he collected, the, he, personally he photographed the, uh, the chapel, <clears throat> his own personal slides to give me a feeling what he was seeing. So designed the, uh, the work in a way to respond to his collections. <clears throat> Um, part of our uh, requirements is that we didn't want to show architects' personal, professional work. We're interested in architects' own personal work, biographical works. This architect is very interesting. He only makes architecture for the dead, like the one you burn for the funerary. So he has a waiting list for like six months to do models so that people can burn them. Um, this project was uh, I invited uh, three Japanese architects, and uh, I was interested about these three relationships, about three of them, because they all wrote a epilogue to each other. So then they not, never worked together. So I invite them to do a project together. One's from uh, Hokkaido, in a very small town, and he built this structure so that you can look at the work of Fujimori's, because there was interesting hierarchy. Because Fujimori said, "I do this, you do the other," and June said, "No, no, no." I built things to, to look at your work. So I thought there was an interesting dynamic of that work relationship of elder generation and younger. And this is a Go Hasegawa. Uh, from the far away, it becomes very clear, but when you walk closer and closer, it becomes very dark. It has to do with the idea of the perception of the, of the, the, the 
And this is the, in um, the Fukushima's um, year, the, the, the natural disaster. What was interesting about this town, village, where everything is completely demolished, you see the street, but you don't see the building. How can you still define the street without buildings? That was a curious thing. <clears throat> and this was a North Korean artist group. Um, they made a depiction of what the street looks like in Beijing. So they have a, if you look at it, what this goal is like in Beijing. They even gave us a rocket for free. And this one is about depicting the sound of the city from the streets. So the whole idea is making the whole entire third floor museum into a street. So when you enter, you kind of forget exactly what that space is like before. Um, I, wor I work on this project with, um, with Ron, Ron Chin. He gave a lecture, I think, last year. I think, David, you invited him to talk about curator. I only met him three times. And the museum asked us to work together. And then we had to sign a contract with a lawyer. And we were waiting in this office. In front of us, there's people filing a divorce. <laughs> and the people are filing a marriage. And so Ron and I were thinking, wait, what, Ron, what am I signing for? He said, I have to sign for you, so when we work together, we cannot split out. <laughs> we have the responsibilities. So Kirito, when he started this, I didn't start to realize architecture is about the social contracts in a way. <laughs> so when you collaborate with your group, sign a contract, because there's always one person who's going to bail out. <laughs> And 1,000 US dollar deposit because you were thinking that you will win it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. The teacher gets me to like <laughs> So we, the whole project was basically, um, you know, at the same time there was an architecture exhibition at, uh, at uh, Venice called Fundamental. So we're also interested in what are the kind of key essential work looking at East Asia. This is uh, Yang Ho Chan. Um, he, one day I was in a conference room in Beijing. He showed me, this is what I've been doing the last couple of years. I'm pretty excited. Comic novels. I said, perfect. We should have this exhibition. He said, should I show you buildings? No, no, no. Just show you comic novels. <laughs> and he even made a film for it as well. But that's why um, both C. Y. Lee and Yang Ho Chan gave him the smallest room in the whole museum. Because they have a lot of history. So. How can you show a small, I mean, short history when it contains a small room? And so I was also invited some um, young um, Taiwanese architect, which I think is also important to see is actually what that direction is. Like you have Wang Zhe, which is David's uh, former student. And Hao. Oh,
this is a 100 speaker of a recorded sound of this composer. This was the most difficult project because these architects, they design it without any drawings. And they work at 9 o'clock at night all the way until 6 o'clock in the morning. So the museum get worried because the structure gets bigger and bigger and there's no calculation for it. So to get bigger, you have to lift this. So, so anyhow, the whole thing was, was a, a lot of uh, conflicts in the cases. Because this, he, he didn't believe in the idea of engineering. It has to be calculated. He said, you just build your idea, you can feel the sense. So, but the engineer for the museum didn't buy it. But that's so Jay. <laughs> <laughs>